Good morning. Welcome to Northmont. I have lots of announcements, so you all need to process whenever you want to. You going to stay there? Okay, good. All right. Dramatic effect. So, good morning. Uh, just a few things to know before we get going. First, uh, this is World Communion Sunday. Uh, we haven't had communion here in a while, and so just uh, recalling that this is uh, our tradition here is that uh, we do so by intinction, which means that you would just come up the center aisle and then just follow the instructions as we go. Uh, if you are not able to do so, uh, we will have someone who is serving uh, in the pews, and so just sort of raise your hand and someone will come to you just to, for you're aware of that. Um, first, I think we have an announcement about youth from Steph Martin. Good morning. As you all may know, today is the first Sunday in October, which means that we are selling greeting cards today for our youth fundraiser. So as you walk out the narthex after the service, there is a table there. Uh, Jenny Hollow will be sitting there. And you can go to her and order gift cards. We have four different boxes of um, combinations of gift cards. They're all handmade, and there are some examples out there that you can look at before you place an order. Again, this is a box of 30 cards for $30, and 15 of, that, of those dollars go straight to the youth. So this is a great fundraiser for us. And while you're out there looking at greeting cards, you can also sign up to bake a pie for the pie auction. The sign-up's right above the table. And the pie auction is on the 21st, so two weeks from today. So you can either bake a pie, or it'd be great if you all would come down, sample some pies, and bid on some pies. Thank you. And can you give that to Rashmi, please, who's right next to you? Hi, everyone. I'm Rashmi. And one of the best things that's happened to me since I've been involved here at Northmont is the opportunity to be involved in Stephen Ministry. I wanted to invite everyone, this event is open and free to the public, and of course all of you, to a presentation I'm going to be doing this Thursday, October 11th, from 7.15 to 8.30 p.m. The details are in your bulletin today. I've been a therapist for about 24 years, and I'm going to be sharing about grief and loss, the stages, my own personal story involved with that, but mostly how you can be helped, how you can work through any grief and loss issues you may have been struggling recently or maybe even from years ago. So it will be an interactive, um, I don't want to say fun evening because it is a serious topic, but it will be a helpful evening. So I hope some of you can join us. Thank you. Can you hang that to Glenn, please? Good morning. Uh, who can tell me what October 28th is? Scottish Heritage Sunday. Once again, we will be celebrating Scottish Heritage Sunday, October 28th. I am here quickly because it was not able to get into the bulletin, but we are going to need volunteers to help make scones and shortbread. Um, next week's bulletin should have some recipes in it, but I just wanted to give you the heads up. To be ready, we're going to ask for volunteers. Thank you. Liam is great at that. Oh, we're actually, it's Mark. Liam is great at that. He helped me make scones yesterday. He does the mixing. Child labor. Good morning, guys. I just want to talk a few moments about mission, or excuse me, about stewardship. He's going to be talking about mission, I assume. So if you guys want to sit down, this is going to take a while. Um, in Exodus, the people of Israel are asked to give... Um, for the creation of the tabernacle. And it, you know the tabernacle, right? Very ornate, very detailed directions on how to give. I want to read a little bit, so bear with me. Uh, this is from Exodus 35. Moses said to the whole Israelite community, this is what the Lord has commanded. From what you have, take an offering for the Lord. Everyone who is willing is to bring the Lord an offering of gold, silver, bronze, blue, purple, and scarlet yarn, fine linen, goat hair, ram skins dyed red, and another type of durable leather, acacia wood, olive oil for the light, spices for the anointing, and uh, fragrant incense, and onyx, and stones, and other gems to be mounted on the ephod and the breastpiece. Now, I think we're good with gold and gems, maybe not so much with the uh, dyed ram skins, so keep that in mind as you're filling out your commitment card. It goes on to read, all who are willing 
men and women alike, came and brought gold and jewelry of all kinds, brooches, earrings, rings, and ornaments. They all presented their gold as an offering to the Lord. He uh, goes on and then in chapter 36 calls um, those who are skilled in one type or another to give of their time and their talent to, to use all these materials and to begin to build. Um, and then he asks that he gives their gifts back from God who has already given them these fine, these fine uh, skills and these jewels and dyed ram skins. Um, we fast forward a little bit further and read this. And the people continued to bring free will offerings morning after morning. So all the skilled workers who were doing all the work on the sanctuary left what they were doing and said to Moses, the people are bringing more than enough for the doing of the work that the Lord has commanded to be done. Then Moses gave an order and they sent word throughout the camp that no man or woman is to make anything else as an offering for the sanctuary. And so the people were restrained from bringing more because what they already had was more than enough to do all the work. What an amazing testament. And I cannot imagine a church where we would say, stop offering, stop giving us your Sunday offering. But we really could do that, knowing what the blessings are that we have from God. So when we start to think about what we're going to put on that commitment card for next year, I really want you guys to think about what the church, what the Israelites did back in Exodus and think about how we can give until it feels good. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Now I'll ask for Jim. Good morning from the Mission Committee. Uh, there's a couple things we want to remind you of today. Being, besides uh, World Communion Sunday, uh, the Presbytery is has a special regular connect collection. Uh, if you saw in your pew envelopes for the month of October here, there was one marked peacemaking. I just want to remind you that that could go on all month if you forgot to bring it today, or you could use one of the pew envelopes. But that was started in 1980 as an effort for the Pres Presbyterian Church to live out a deeper commitment to the faithfulness of God. The offering on World Communion Sunday generally goes 25% is retained by this congregation for distributing for peace, peacemaking, and 25% is given to the synods and presbyteries, and the remaining 50% is used by the Presbyterian Mission Agency in a co collaboration of projects for education of ch Christians and witness. Okay, they're trying to bring peace through showing of the Bible. And if you remember in the Beatitudes, Christ said, blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called the children of God. Uh, so please take a minute, if you can, and prayerfully go to the uh, peacemaking envelope or offering. Uh, the second thing we have to show you today is we're kicking off a three-week campaign for our friends down at the Northside Common Ministries. Uh, it's the annual food drive we have, and they are requesting something a little different. First of all, they want chunky soup, some hearty soup. Not the condensed soups that we find, but they want some hearty soups. And you can find them anywhere. You can find them at Aldi's. They don't have to be Campbell's Chunky Soup or Progresso or anything like that, but something similar. Uh, they will take any perishable item. Uh, this one happens to be a jar of spaghetti sauce, but it's plastic. Because when they hand out items in the pantry, it, they get 25 pounds for the month. So anything lighter weight like this versus a glass jar allows them to spread their food a little bit further. And finally, on the bags we have labels, and there's a little different request. And that is something like shampoo. And you say, what's shampoo or soap or deodorant have to do with food pantry? And very simply, food stamps can't purchase these items. So when it comes to the end of the month, if you have to decide between a bottle of shampoo and food, they would take food. So we want to supply them with cleaning items, health hygiene, any you know, common multi-purpose cleaner so that they can use this instead of using their own money, which 
if they're in a pinch, won't get spent on themselves. And I threw in a roll of paper towels. Again, food stamps don't cover paper items. So you can't get Kleenexes, napkins, or paper towels with anything but your own cash. So that is, those are the items that were requested by the food pantry themselves. So I ask you to please consider donating that. We will be handing out bags at the end of today. It's a three-week campaign. When you fill the bags, please put them up at the across from the office in that coat room. Or if you don't want to do the shopping or they're too heavy to carry, monetary items, they will always take money because then they can purchase in larger quantities and get a better price for things and the things that they need. All you need to use is a pew envelope and mark Northside Common Ministry or Pantry on it and we'll take care of it from there. And finally, on a sad note, uh, for the past month, Ted and I have been saying, we have Malawi visitors coming. Let's get prepared. Well, many of the travelers were denied visas. So they will not be coming to the country. There are some, but they were refused visas. Reasons we don't know for sure. We might eventually find out. Included in the one that did not get a visa is our guest, Davey, from the Mangochi Church. So I don't know right now how that's going to work out. We may get a visitor for a day or two, but as many as that are coming around is going to be spread very thin. So this is the first time something like this has happened in 25 years. So we're hoping things get straightened out. Uh, so he won't be joining us after all. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Jim. All right, now if you may stand and rise and meet and greet with one another.
Will you stand for the call to worship? Sing to the Lord, whose mercy is from everlasting to everlasting. How can we sing the Lord's song when so many are without us? Sing to the Lord, whose faithfulness renews us every morning. But how can we sing the Lord's song when so many are gone? But how, excuse me, sing to the Lord who has not forgotten his, the melodies of salvation. Let us remember the joy of the Lord and sing a new song together. Please join me in the prayer of invocation. Almighty God, even as the cries of injustice linger in the morning, even as the hustle of busyness rumbles through the day, quiet our hearts, still our thoughts, join us in our worship. Remember us in your mercy as we try to remember you through the proclamation of your good news in story and in song and through the hospitality of your gracious table. Welcome us again, one Lord, Creator, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Great indeed is the faithfulness of God, and yet our hearts are not so reliable. We wander, we argue, we forget. We divide ourselves with anger and bitterness and falsehood. Let's try to come back together again, and let's start with the truth. Let's confess our sins to God and also to each other, first together, then silently. Almighty God, Mother of mercy, Father of grace, you have called us to one table, but we have pursued our own course. You have promised us the abundance of all creation, but in our greed and in our envy, the world goes without. You have promised us the bread of life itself, but in our pride and in our arrogance, the world goes hungry. You have promised us the waters of peace and justice, but in our weakness and our discord, 
the world goes thirsty. And now we are famished too, Lord. Have mercy on us, forgive us again, transform us at the table and for the table, and send us from the table as servants of your righteousness, by the power of your Son, our Lord. Amen. Even when our cups run dry, God's grace overflows. Even when our plates are empty, God's generosity overflows. And even when our hearts feel barren, God's love overflows. Friends, you have been called and claimed by the God of all things, and by the abundance of God's grace, and by the power of God's love, your sins have been forgiven. Thanks be to God. Amen. All right, if any and all children who are here would like to join me up at the front, that'd be swell. Oh, wait, I forgot something. Oh, hi. Hold on one sec. Now, you three look to me okay, but you've got a little something right here. I think it's an eyelash. Yeah, it's just a little, a little something. You have, well, hold on. You've just got just one little, okay, that's, that's fine. I think you, well, hold on. Yeah. You look okay. You have a little cake. No, what is that? Fudge? What is that? Okay, just a little something. So, I think now you're looking fine. Um... Why are you looking at me like that? <laughs> I have something in my eye. It clearly should not be there. Okay, so let me... It's a lighter, right, which seems like... 
There. Is that better? Well, I mean, relatively, right? It could still this. Okay. So, uh, <laughs> today, our story is Jesus talking. What? And Jesus is saying, look, friends, um, you're a little judgy. Do you know anyone in your life who's a little judgy? What's it mean to be a little judgy? You judge people. What's that? What's it mean if you judge people? Is it a good word or a bad word? Do you want to be judged by someone? No. It depends. depends. Okay. It's like a play. Ah, if you're a judge and you're saying, which one did better? Yeah. Okay. See? The more you know. Okay. You're kind of putting them down a little bit, right? Like, oh, really? That shirt? Like, that seems a little judgy, right? Kind of rude. Like, not really kind, right? And so, usually, we're picking out things that really don't matter, right? If you like that shirt, if you like those shoes, if you whatever, that's fine. But I, you see this? I was picking out little things about you that need to change. Where I have a huge thing right here I need to change before I can talk about any of you, right? And that's what Jesus is saying. Look, friend, it's okay to try to help someone out and point out something or whatever, but work on yourself first because you're not perfect, buddy, right? Don't worry about this. We're not perfect, so we need to help other people, but we can't say, we can't think of ourselves as better than other people just because they look differently than us or they act differently than us or they do things that we don't understand. We are people who are called, who God is saying, I need you to be the people who set the example for how we treat one another, how we love one another, how we respect one another, and how we are kind to one another. So work on you, buddy, and what's sticking out of your face before you start meddling in my face. Ready to pray? All right, good. God, thank you so much that you love us uh, no matter what. Allow us to be people who love other people no matter what. We're all different. In lots of ways, we're the same. So always allow us to love and be kind. We ask these things in Christ's name. Amen. Our first lesson this morning is from Leviticus 19, 9 to 15, and it can be found in your pew Bible in the Old Testament, page 106. When you reap the harvest of your land, you shall not reap to the very edges of your field or gather the gleanings of your harvest. You shall not strip your vineyard bare or gather the fallen grapes from your vineyard. You shall leave them for the poor and the alien. I am the Lord your God. You shall not steal, you shall not deal falsely, and you shall not lie to one another. And you shall not swear falsely by my name, profaning the name of your God. I am the Lord. You shall not defraud your neighbor, you shall not steal, and you shall not keep for yourself the wages of a laborer until morning. You shall not revile the deaf or put a stumbling block before the blind, you shall fear your God. I am the Lord. I have another verse. You shall not render an unjust judgment. You shall not be partial to the poor or defer to the great. With justice you shall judge your neighbor. This is the word of the Lord. Be to God. Our second reading is from the New Testament, and it's found in the New in your pew Bible. <laughs> On page, I'll get it in a minute, 65, in the New Testament. We're reading Luke 6, 37 to 42. Do not judge and you will not be judged. Do not condemn and you will not be condemned. Forgive and you will be forgiven. Give and it will be given to you. A good measure pressed down, shaken together, running over, will be put into your lap. For the measure you give will be the measure you get back. 
This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Will you please pray with me? Holy and gracious Lord, as we seek your face this morning, we do so with friends all around the world. Breaking of bread and drinking of cup and proclaiming your good news on one morning. We thank you for the privilege it is to share with them in your word and to reflect it in our lives. And we pray these things in Christ's name. Amen. So this might sound strange to you. It may not to some of you if you know little weird things about me. But I've always been fascinated by the concept of sight. Just the sheer science behind it, which I know about this much of, but I think it's, a, it's fascinating. Just all of the little things that have to come together for us to be able to see what we can see. And our eyes tell us practically everything we know about the world around us. And it boggles my mind that as important as my sight is to my daily living, to my work, that there are creatures on earth that are born without eyes. And they're born without eyes, not because this is some mistake, but they have absolutely no use for them, so why grow things that you don't need to have? Because these creatures live at the bottom of the ocean. They live there where there is no light, and so no reason to have eyes. Light can't get them. Light can't reach them. Also, just as an aside, now that I'm thinking about it, Places Where No Light Can Reach seems like a good sermon title, but I'm not sure where it's going to go, but we'll, maybe for another day. Um, sometimes I try to imagine what it would be like to have some sort of discussion or to, to try to an interaction with a creature that has never seen, and not only never seen, but didn't even know that seeing was a thing that they could do. Because, again, I have no use for it, and you're telling me that there's a sense that I don't have. I can touch, I can taste, I can smell, but you're telling me that I can also see things. You'll get lost in that thought if you allow it to happen. But it's amazing to think about, and it's not a disability. In that world, they're not lacking anything. They have everything they need. It's only a disability if it's something that you know you could have and don't have. And I suppose, though, that there are some benefits to not being able to see anything. I don't have to worry so much about whether my shoes and my socks match. That's off the table. I don't have to worry about that anymore. And I don't have to worry about how I'm being judged out in the world. What do I look like? Do I look good enough to you? We all remember grade school and high school, or we have um, students that are now in those parts of life, and unfortunately that doesn't really go away. It changes, it gets more polite sometimes, but it doesn't go away. Some of those things would be eliminated. Then on the other end of the spectrum, literally, sight also has its inherent limitations. We, can, we can't see everything that's around us because humans can only perceive a certain range of light and color. There is more out there than we can physically see. And so we have named some of that, right? We have infrared. We know it exists, but we can't perceive it. And we have ultraviolet. It exists, but we can't perceive it. Our eyes can't pick it up. It's outside of our range. And so there, that means that there are colors that we can't see. And I was listening to a podcast recently. Anyone who knows that I do that can laugh. Uh, and I learned... Uh, I was learning about color, and there are certain birds that can see in that range that we can't see in. And so they can literally see a world that exists outside of our perception. They know more about the world around us than you and I do, at least optically. And that's pretty fascinating. It's fascinating to ponder what those worlds look like or don't look like. Because both the fish and the bird experience this world very, very, very differently than I do. And so it makes me wonder, what else am I missing? What else am I not sensing? Is there a sense out there that I don't have that I should? Our first reading for this morning 
beckons us to imagine and live in a world that is different. When you reap the harvest of your land, do not reap to the very edges of your field or gather the gleanings of your harvest. Do not go over your vineyard a second time or pick up the grapes that have fallen. Leave them for the poor and the foreigner. I am the Lord your God. And then in the next line, the very next line, it says, do not steal. Now, I looked at this back and forth, this don't do this, do this, back and forth, right next to each other. And I decided to rename this verse. I'm calling this verse now the redemption of Peter Rabbit. And if you know the story of Peter Rabbit, Peter Rabbit was someone who was, well, doing a little bit more gleaning in someone else's garden than he should have been doing. And my assumption is that before this scripture passage this morning, that someone who had someone who was poor or a, uh, or a foreigner on their, line, on their land, and that person was taking a little extra food without being given permission, sort of the Peter Rabbit of their day, then I, as the owner of that land, would have every right to seek justice. But in this one line, in this one line, God changes the very definition of justice. It's wrong to steal, and it is just as wrong to leave nothing for the stranger. The two are put right up next to each other. I am the Lord your God. Instead of punishing strangers, it invites them in. Instead of chasing off the Peter Rabbits of the world, out of our gardens, we welcome him home. This is the kingdom of God as God presents it to us in this passage. The opportunity to see the world through God's eyes. That's the sense that we are missing most of the time. We understand God's will as well as that fish would do on an eye exam. We miss something about what God is telling us. And the evidence that we miss it time and time again lies in our second scripture for this morning. Because the message that Moses gave to them in the desert is the same message that Jesus is giving to these folks right in front of him. And it's the same message that we're all telling each other today. Judgment, which is the main focus of this morning, judgment is lazy living. And we're called to something more. And we confuse judgment with something much more useful. Judgment is not the same as evaluation. I can evaluate something and gain something from it, positive, and judgment does the opposite. When one evaluates something, one isn't being judgmental because their goals are different. Evaluation seeks to assess values. What are your values? Do they match up with my values? Do I understand the inherent value that you bring, and how can you, we harness that? That's evaluation. Judgment seeks to assess differences. So let me give you an example. If the PNC, who hired me, most of you are here, I think, decided not to hire me, and maybe right now they're thinking about it. If they had decided not to hire me based on my hair or my car, that would be an assessment of difference not of values. That's, that's what judgment is. That's an assessment of difference. But if the PNC would have decided not to hire me because I was accused of a sexual assault, then that would be an assessment of values. That's evaluation. One who evaluates, assesses value, should get the plank out of their own eye before they do so, but after they remove that plank from their own eye, they should get back to the work of pointing out the speck in mine. Because if we don't, if we don't do both, if I don't self-assess and assess where you are, then we are both blind and we don't get anywhere and things stop. And of course, you and I have had and will continue to have a hard time with judgment. We see people as categories and not individual faces. For instance, we have a hard time seeing those who are poor as real people. And these are the reasons that for us that we can sometimes just ignore it. 
Because the more that we know someone, the more that we see their faces and know their names, the more we feel compelled to do something. And so if people are just categories, the poor, the homeless, then that's easier to ignore. There's um, someone I know on Facebook who I've never actually met in real life, who for a long time ran a ministry that included a shelter for men. And he was giving a talk one time about the source of homelessness. He was considered an expert in the field. Tell us why, from a societal standpoint, why homelessness exists. What's at its core? How do we solve this? Where, what do we get to? And there were some common kind of themes that people were thinking, well, this must be it. Think about the opioid crisis, etc. But he never once said it was substance abuse, and he never said it was bad choices. He never mentioned any of those other classic factors that we talk about or hear about when we talk about homelessness. His answer to this question was actually starting with a question. He answers a question with a question, which is a very kind of Jesus-y thing to do. And so he asked us this simple question. Would your mother ever be homeless? Well, of course not. Of course my mother would never be homeless. I would never allow my mother to be homeless. I would do anything I had to do to ensure that my mother was never homeless. Same for my child. The same for a good friend. I would move mountains to ensure that the people I love are not homeless. What's the difference, though, between your mother, your child, your best friend, and the homeless? Because you and I make mistakes all the time. We get ourselves into trouble, and we have to get bailed out, either metaphorically or literally. The difference is relationships. Because I know, I was looking at my phone this morning, I know that right now, If I needed a place to stay, there are about 20 people in my phone who would make sure that I was not sleeping on the the streets this evening. They wouldn't allow it. It wouldn't happen. They'd wire me money, they'd come pick me up, whatever it would happen to be. Because I am three bad decisions away from having no place to live. Sometimes it feels like maybe one or two, right, Sarah? Yeah. (laughs) But, (laughs) But I am about three really bad, and you can think through what the bad decisions are, right? I'm about three bad, really bad decisions away from having no place to live. But that won't happen because of those 20. And the only difference between me and the stranger among us is relationships. When we remember, when we matter to people, they actually see who we are. And we see them differently. Now, in just a little bit of time, we're going to be taking communion together. And what's special about today is that we are literally doing so with the world, as I mentioned before. If we were taking this communion in India or Malawi, I'm sure that something about that communion would look differently. If we were taking it in a Catholic church down the street, I know it would look differently as well. And we can judge the differences, or we can assess the values. What is it that we all value, regardless of the aesthetics? What we value commonly is that the world-changing, life-altering power of the kingdom of God is alive at this table and alive in our hearts. What is common is the, the covenant that Christ makes with us and ensures us that we will never be left alone and never be left the same. And it's the promise that we make that we will seek that kingdom in every single thing that we do for ourselves and for the stranger until the stranger is our neighbor. And may it be so the world over. And to God be the glory this day and forevermore. Amen. My friends, we now stand and say what it is that we believe. This morning, using a portion of the Belhar Confession, 
the only one of our confessions in our book of confessions written from the global south, this from South Africa. We believe that Christ's work of reconciliation is made manifest in the church as the community of believers who have been reconciled with God and with one another. The unity is therefore both a gift and an obligation for the church of Jesus Christ that through the working of God's spirit is a binding force, yet simultaneously a reality which must be earnestly pursued and sought, one which the people of God must continually be built up to attain. This unity can be established only in freedom and not under constraint, that the variety of spiritual gifts, opportunities, backgrounds, convictions, as well as the various languages and cultures, are by virtue of the reconciliation in Christ, opportunities for mutual service and enrichment within the one visible people of God. Please be seated. And now if we have any prayer concerns or joys to share with one another, I would ask that we would do so now. For Tina, for, I'm sorry? For those, the Malawi visitors who can attend and for those who cannot. For Patricia, thank you. For Brett Kavanaugh, certainly. Others? For Russ Bailey? For those battling cancer and for those survivors? Yes. Vera Hassel? Okay. Yes. Yes. <laughs> uh, on that note, um, Fred uh, Bjorn is in, the, uh, is in Passivant this weekend. Uh, he had a, I don't know what you call it, uh, his, his heartbeat was not regular. It was, uh, and so they've been trying to, to I'm sorry? There we go. I, I wasn't, there was some other term I heard them use, but I couldn't remember. That might have been it. Um, so they're trying to straighten that out. Um, and so I'll see them here this afternoon, but I just wanted to let you all know that uh, Sarah Jane and Fred will be at Passivant, and so if you want to send along cards or anything else, I'm sure that would be appreciated. For our Malawi partnership, thank you. For our overwhelming need for unity, certainly, especially this morning as we consider world communion. Well, let us go before God in prayer. God, as our concerns lift up, we are in desperate need of compassion. We are in desperate need of forgiveness. We are in desperate need of discernment, of evaluating before us what our values are, what our needs are, 
and how we can be those, even when we disagree, can find ways to work together. We have people before us who are in need of great prayer, of great healing. We ask that you would bring that healing and that you would give those who walk beside them the strength that they need to be there and to love. For all those things mentioned here this morning, all those individuals that we lift up and the value that they have in our lives, we ask that you would continue to strengthen the bonds between us, that you would give us hope, that you would give us justice and love. We thank you that in all of these things, we have you in our midst. And we pray now the prayer that you taught us say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not in temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And now if the ushers will please come forward, we'll receive this morning's offer.
replenish us again, O God. Fill our hearts with your joy. Envelop us with your constant grace. Allow us to be those who replenish the same in others. And with your tithes and offerings, might we have a faithful ministry in this place, seeking to love without measure. We pray all of these things in Christ's name. Amen. Brothers and sisters in Christ, the Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. You know, in the passage that we had for this morning, there was, uh, there was an interesting little tidbit that I saw that I couldn't add into the sermon. It just didn't make any sense. It was an outlier. And it's in that passage there in Luke, it talks about uh, receiving a measure and taking it home. And it talked about packing it and sifting it and, and securing it. And then putting it in your lap. And I was like, what are they talking about in this thing? And so what I discovered was that uh, men who would go to basically to the market, uh, if they were buying grain, they didn't have pockets. I don't know why no one thought about this at this point, but they didn't have pockets. And so they had, a, they had a, basically something like this in their, on their robe that they could collect it like this. So that's why it's in their lap. And I was thinking about, I almost did this this morning, but I didn't f- see any brown sugar in the uh, kitchen. You know when you, you can get a scoop of brown sugar and you can just have it loose like that? But you can get a lot more if you pack it down. Well, I love the image that the, the person writing this, that Luke is trying to show us, that, that what we receive, the fairness of this, is that we are those who have this packed down, sifted, I'm giving you as much as necessary, as much as I can get in here, I am giving to you. And that really opened up the image of what this person was doing. And I think about this table. And in this, this table, you're going to get a little thing of bread, and you're going to get a little bit of juice, and then you'll walk on out of here. And you'll, you'll go to a buffet later, and you'll fill up. Um, but what I remember in this, in this meal, and the reason we can call it a meal, is because of all of the blessings that we have, not only because of where Christ is in the room and how Christ offers it to us, but because we get to do this with a community of saints who pour themselves into us just as we do for them. That is the packed grain in your lap meal that we celebrate this morning. And it is a tremendous blessing, as I've already said, to be able to know that I am having that type of meal. How much more blessed am I? Because I not only celebrate with all of you, but with all of those who have come before us, who now celebrate at God's table, and all those who will come after us, but also all around the world. The tremendous blessing that it is to share this meal with one another is overwhelming. And thankfully, as we gather ourselves and and ready ourselves for this meal, we have words given to us by the Apostle Paul. He said that on the night of his rest, our Savior took bread and he blessed it and he broke it and he gave it to his disciples saying, take and eat. This is my body broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way he took the cup, saying, this is the cup of the new covenant shed in my blood for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in remembrance of me. For every time you eat this bread and you drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. My friends, these are the gifts of God for the people of God, and all is ready.
Let us pray. Gracious and loving God, we thank you for all the ways that you love us and the ways that you are present with us, especially in this time of sharing this meal with all of our brothers and sisters in Christ in this sanctuary and around the world. Be with us, work through us, break us down and build us up to do your will. Unite us in your love as we go from this place. We ask all of this in Christ's name. Amen. My friends, uh, Jan Beatty is up here uh, as a Stephen minister, uh, and wherever you are in need, or if you just need someone to listen, uh, to, listen to you, or just to be with. Uh, before I give the benediction, I would like to bless the elements that the Stephen ministers uh, will, will have as they go out into our community to uh, serve those who cannot be here with us. Gracious and holy God, we ask that you would be with the ministry of the Stephen ministers, that you would be with those who they bless and they serve, Bless this bread and this cup to their bodies. Allow it that they might feel your presence and warmth wherever they are. We pray all these things in Christ's name. Amen. Hear now these words. My friends, you and I are never going to do this perfectly. We are always going to be people who are in between, seeing the limits of not seeing enough and the limits of seeing too much. We will be those who will struggle with how we see one another, how we treat one another, and how we teach our children to do the same, because they are watching what we do. But thankfully, as we do all of this work, we know that we come back to this table to proclaim that something that is good and something that is true in our lives and in the lives of the people that we judge and in the lives of those that we love that we are all people united under this one table, at this one table, as those who serve Christ, as those who serve each other. And thankfully, as we seek to go out into the world to do better and to be better and to live lives full of the love that we are called to, we never do these things alone, but we go forward with the faith and the compassion and love of the one who creates us and redeems us and sustains us, now and always. Amen.